Hi everyone. So today we're going to be talking about this technique called chunking that has been really helpful for people if they find themselves getting stuck on sentences or there's a super long sentence and they're not sure how to approach it um, and how to kind of break it down into smaller parts. So that's what chunking is all about. You take a larger sentence, you break it into smaller parts, and it's usually nice to break it either at like a punctuation mark, so something like a comma, a colon, or a semicolon. Um, another nice way to break it up is for conjunctions and kind of transition words. So if you see things like but, and, um, however, stuff like that. And then you can also look at it from the perspective of if you're reading a really long sentence and you're kind of like getting lost at some point and thinking, uh, what am I reading? It's a good point to stop before that. So the goal of chunking is to break up the sentence into parts so that you can see what is kind of like the main topic or person or group that they're referring to in each part and then how do we kind of string it together so that we can understand the overall main idea of the sentence so chunking is something that you can do either for every sentence that you're looking at that's super long or just sentences that you feel stuck on so i'm going to walk you through how to do that for um, a passage and it's going to be a passage from khan academy um, so it's going to be freely available for you guys so this is the Khan Academy website where you can find free practice on the MCAT CARS materials. And I'm gonna go over this passage called Primordial and Complex Jealousy. So kind of when you open up the MCAT CARS page, you can just scroll down to this one. And so I'm gonna show you how to chunk out uh, these sentences, especially if they're a lot longer so that you get a feel for it and practice it. So I'm gonna go ahead by starting and reading the first sentence. So while the origins and possible function of jealousy have been debated, most theorists agree on one defining feature. It requires a social triangle arising when an interloper threatens an important relationship. So we've got our first sentence right here, kind of a lot going on there. So let's break it down into a few parts. So it's kind of saying while the origins and possible function of jealousy have been debated, I'll stop right there. That's basically hinting that we're not really sure about maybe where jealousy came from or possibly why we're using it. Most theorists agree on one defining feature. So I'm going to break it at that colon so that we kind of understand, okay, they're talking about the origins and maybe roles or reasons why we feel jealousy, and it's still up for debate. Uh, there are a lot of theorists that maybe agree on kind of one aspect of jealousy, and that one aspect is it requires a social triangle arising when an interloper threatens an important relationship. So you can usually, you can usually just like end it right there. But if you want, you could end it right here at the comma just to break it up. So the one defining feature that a lot of theorists agree on about jealousy is that you need some kind of social triangle. And how does a social triangle look like? Or like, how do we define that? It's when an interloper or one person threatens a relationship, probably between two people. Um, and so what's nice here is it kind of introduces this idea um, that we don't really know why jealousy where it comes from or why we use it, then they say, hey, there's some theorists who maybe agree on at least one thing about jealousy and that that thing is that it requires a social triangle. And then this part of the sentence defines that for us. So this is like setting the scene for us, kind of more setting the scene for us and saying, hey, this is what we're gonna talk about. They tell us what it is, that defining feature. So I'll say defining feature. And then they kind of like define it, AKA paint a better picture of what that defining feature looks like. So there's no right or wrong way to chunk. It's more of just breaking it up into parts to kind of understand what's going on. Um, for example, if you're like, hey, I feel comfortable reading this, that whole section of the sentence, you don't have to break it up at social triangle. Um, you can just kind of say, they talk about social triangle and then they explain what exactly that looks like. So that's gonna be the first one. Um, and let me kind of just clean this up just a little bit. It's a little bit less confusing. So I'm going to keep all of the places that we broke it up and I'll kind of get rid of the highlights there. So we'll go ahead and read the next one. A common assumption has been that the elicitation of jealousy involves and perhaps requires complex cognitive abilities, including appraisals about the meaning of the rival, of the rival threat to oneself or self-esteem and to one's relationship. Another really long sentence, that's like three lines, so we're gonna break that up. 
It says a common assumption has been the elicitation of jealousy involves and requires complex cognitive abilities. So I'm actually going to just put it right there. Um, so that's telling me, okay, we have a, some kind of assumption about jealousy. What is that going to look like? The specific thing we're talking about is when jealousy is kind of elicited or comes about, and it involves or even requires uh, complex cognitive abilities. So I'm just going to stop it there. So I actually think we could probably get rid of this one right here if we wanted to. But the main takeaway so far is that we know that um, when jealousy comes about, there's something involved with it, and it might even be required, and that something is complex cognitive abilities. So now we're kind of breaking up what they're talking about. And what does that look like? This looks like appraisals or kind of assessing uh, a rival threat to oneself and to one's relationship. So now they're kind of like defining what that looks like for us. Um, how would we use our cognitive abilities when it comes to jealousy? So again, telling us kind of like what's going on. So I'll just say like intro here. Um, and it's talking about eliciting jealousy and then a little bit more details about what it, what it requires or what it involves and that's cognitive abilities. And then what does that look like? So just say cognabilities. So that kind of just describes it for us further. So we start to appraise or think about um, how certain threats or that rival, maybe the interloper that they're referring to, affects our self-esteem and our relationship. Um, so yeah, that is the first paragraph that we're gonna define. But you know, uh, unfortunately, Zoom doesn't help me keep the um, kind of annotation. So I'm gonna go ahead and clear this off. But if you want, pause the screen, take a screenshot of it, and you can use those as examples. So now we're gonna move on to the next paragraph. Um, let's see if that's the end. Okay. So one possibility is that jealousy first evolved in the context of sibling parent relationships where dependent offspring compete for parental resources. Okay, so this one isn't that bad. Um, if you're comfortable with this one, you don't even have to break it up. We mostly know that they're talking about um, the fact that jealousy first came from sibling parent relationships. But if you wanted to break it up, we could say that we could end it right here. So they're kind of entertaining how jealousy came about, which relates back to some of the discussion we had in the first paragraph about debate about jealousy's origin. So maybe it first came about because of sibling parent relationships. Um, and then you may be wondering, well, why exactly did it come out that way? Or what does that look like? It's when dependent offspring compete for parental resources. So this is introducing this idea of kind of like sibling parent relationships. And then this one is like defining it for us. Defining or kind of telling us what that would look like, or maybe a little bit of why uh, jealousy evolved in that context. So then it says an implication of this hypothesis is that jealousy may have a primordial or core form that can be triggered without complex cognition about the self or about the meaning of social interaction. So long sentence, almost three lines. So let's go ahead and break that up. And let me just clean up these really quick. Okay, so for that next sentence is it's talking about an implication of the hypothesis. So maybe an impact of it um, or further analysis. So an implication of the hypothesis, I'll just put that there. What is the implication? That jealousy may have been a primordial or core form um, that can be triggered without complex cognition about the self. A little bit longer. So you can either split it up here or here. I'll split it up right here so that we know that, okay, the implication or impact of this hypothesis, what exactly is that? Jealousy may have been primordial or a core form. Okay, when does that kind of come about? It can be triggered without a complex cognition about the self. Um, and it can also be triggered without a cognition about the meaning of a social interaction. So you can either decide to keep this whole last line over there, or you can split it up just so that you know, okay, there's two things we're talking about here. Um, this primordial jealousy form can be triggered either without this complex cognition or without really understanding the meaning of a social interaction. So yeah, I meant to put two there. Um, so that's another way that we can kind of break down that sentence. I'll just clean up a little bit here. So 
what you're noticing is that we're kind of breaking up each sentence into parts of like, okay, giving me an idea, elaborating on further, telling me a little bit more, um, that kind of stuff. So we know how all this information is linked together. And it really helps you process what you're reading. So then it says this primordial form of jealousy may be elicited by the relatively simple perception that an attachment figure or loved one's attention has been captured by a potential usurper, which suffices to elicit a motive to regain the loved one's attention and block a liaison. Okay, wow, that's really long. That is like several lines long. So let's go ahead and break that down. So this primordial form of jealousy may be elicited by, I'll stop it right there so we know what causes this primordial form of jealousy and what, what triggers it. So it's elicited by this relatively simple perception that an attachment figure or loved one's attention has been captured by a usurper. So you could either break it up over here or you could break it up there. Another option is that you can just keep that first one there and stop it right here. So the primordial form of jealousy may be elicited by a simple perception. And what kind of perception is that? What does that look like? It's basically perceiving that an attachment figure or loved one's attention, so someone that you kind of value, has been captured by someone else. So someone else is taking your attention. And so this suffices to elicit a motive to regain the loved one's attention and block the liaison, aka block that usurper. Um, and so you could leave that sentence like that. Um, or if you're like, okay, this just feels too much, I can just cut it right here. So once you basically have that primordial form of jealousy, which can be elicited by some kind of simple perception, what that perception is, is that we perceive that an attachment figure or one of our loved one's interests or attention has been captured by someone else. Then what that does, or kind of the result of that, is it causes a motive in us to try to regain that person's attention. Um, and so it's you can kind of treat each chunk as like a little flow chart. Um, you have this perception that basically someone else is taking your loved one or your attachment's attention. That leads to jealousy. And that also leads to a motive or kind of like action to go ahead and regain that person's attention. Um, and so that's how you can kind of use chunking to break up that relationship. Then we have primordial jealousy may serve as a building block for jealousy elicited by more complex cognitive processes. So this one isn't that bad. Um, and we can also break it up just right here. So primordial jealousy can act as a building block, a building block towards what? For jealousy elicited by more complex cognitive processes. So a building block so that we have more complex cognitive or mental thinking um, for the purpose of jealousy. So for the next sentence, it says, for example, in adult human relationships, the experience of jealousy is greatly impacted by additional appraisals about the meaning of the interaction. So does this mate mean my mate will leave me? Am I unlovable, etc.? cetera? Um, so again, another long one that we're gonna break down. So it says, for example, in adult human relationships, so that's the context that we're looking at this example in, the experience of jealousy is greatly impacted. So our experience as adults in human relationships is jealousy can be impacted. And what exactly impacts it? Additional appraisals or us thinking through about the meaning of an interaction. So the basic gist of this sentence is that adult human relationships and how people experience jealousy can be affected by how we think about the meaning of an interaction. And you can also split it here so that we can kind of understand, okay, these are all examples of how we try to appraise or assess the meaning of an interaction. And for the next sentence, in both primordial and complex cases of jealousy, there's a motivation to restore the relationship and remove the usurper. So it's kind of saying in primordial, so the stuff we talked about earlier, as well as complex cases of jealousy, which is the stuff we just covered right here. So in both cases, there is a motivation to restore the relationship and remove the usurper. So you can leave it there to just kind of show that both cases of jealousy kind of have the same underlying motivation, or you can split it where it's there's a motivation that's common between the two. What does that look like to restore the relationship and remove this person who captured um, 
you know, our loved one or our attachment figure's attention. But this break right here is super optional. Um, it's more of just a way to kind of pace yourself when you're reading. And the last sentence, however, in the latter case, interpretations of the situation play a larger role in the elicitation and experience of the motion. So, however, in the latter case, or the kind of case that we talked about here, interpretations of the situation play a larger role. So how we interpret the situation has some kind of big impact. What kind of role does it have in eliciting or causing and then the experience of the emotion? So this is related to that. So that's how you can break down um, paragraphs with chunking. And as you're reading, um, if you're like, okay, I can't annotate my screen, you can highlight the little spaces that you would want to like go ahead and chunk out. Um, that's one thing that's been helpful for people. Another is that you can take your cursor and kind of put it over that spot here and just do that. Or some students like to just highlight it with their cursor so that they read it as they go. So kind of say, okay, this primordial form of jealousy may be elicited like here by the re relatively simple perception then attachment figure or loved one's attention has been captured and then they'll go here which suffices it so you can do that with your cursor that's honestly probably going to save more time than maybe highlighting in between um, and what you can do is kind of what we did throughout the process is as you go through each chunk you can highlight a little bit of it that you feel like is important um, and yeah so that is an example of chunking the paragraph um, and chunking each sentence in it. I hope this was really helpful and I would definitely recommend giving this strategy out for a few days to see if you like it, if it helps you with comprehension, and if this is something you want to implement into your practice. So yeah, thanks for your time today. Um, any ways you can support the channel, I'd appreciate it, whether that's subscribing, commenting, sharing this with a friend, or donating. Um, and again, be sure to comment anything you want to see below, and thanks so much for watching.